my plan is to probably not spend very much time on the family relationship stuff. Um, I want to talk particularly about um, the honour clauses and the commercial agreement stuff. Um, you can wave me down if that doesn't suit you. Partly I'm going to do that because I think it's more interesting. Um, and, but I think we'll talk about some of the initial concepts. Before I do, the first time I think this semester I've shown you a slide from the LSS. They send them out every week, but we have a class on Monday and if I don't get them before my class, I don't show them. So this is where we're at. Um, there's some really awesome stuff happening. If you're not already involved in the LSS, you should be. It's a great way to meet your people. And look, join, join the LSS. Of course, I'm going to point out this one, legal research class. How awesome is that? By the time you get to do that, it's on immediately before this class. So for those of you who want to leave work a little bit earlier and come and do that, I know it's after the first assignment, purposefully designed that way um, because you guys learn a lot about research really early on and it's kind of just full on. Now you've got had an opportunity to do a couple of assignments and see where your real questions are. And so it's a good time to consolidate that. Uh, the academic who's running it is awesome. Like, she is so cool, so she would be me. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure there'll be somebody from the library there as well. There's a couple of alumni. We've been doing this. I, I sort of started this off as a bit of a love project about four years ago now because it was just doing my head in how much, how hard it is for you guys to contextualise the research stuff. So, uh, so it'll be over in the Tom Smith reading room, it'll be immediately before this class which could mean that um, this class starts a little bit late. In the past I have live streamed it um, just on Zoom uh, but that it's not the same as being there. Tickets for that are who? Oh, just show up. Just show. I, I think they're trying to work out how many there are, but we're not allowed to eat or drink, so it's not like they're counting our names for chips and beer. So, but yeah, if you can't find the ticket stuff, I'd say just show up or send me an email and I'll tell Steph. I'm on the LSS Facebook page, but I'm not on Facebook and I don't want to be on Facebook, so I want to get you there in another way. Event, tell me. Yeah. Event Pride. Event. Yeah. Event Pride. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, I'd just show up. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Okay, so basically, um, I'm just going to skip through the stuff that this is all about and we're going straight to my um, little overview of how I think about intention. So basically, intention, firstly, we've got to sort of identify whether or not there's an express statement. It's a hell of a lot easier if the parties say outright, we intend to be bound. So if you have a deed, for example, there is never going to be a question about whether the party is intended to be bound by the contents of the deed or not. That whole act of signing, sealing and delivering is an external manifesta manifestation of that. So again, if you don't think your mother-in-law is going to pay for you to drive the truck back from Cooper PD, actually getting a signed document would be a handy thing to do, um, particularly a deed. If you're going to do it as an agreement, like actually having, even if it's an exchange of letters or an email, specifically saying, this is a formal agreement. The intention is that this is going to be an agreement. Um, but where there's no express statement, then Ultimately, the category of conduct will affect the onus. That's onus with an O, going back to my butt jokes. Um, so onus is shorthand here for onus of proof. So what's the onus of proof? Come on, there's a few of you doing a crim moot, so I'm sure that you've been thinking about onus of proof. Onus probably a Latin term, I'm assuming, means who's responsible for proving that thing. The onus of proof is the person whose turn it is to submit the evidence. So if there's no express uh, statement, the onus of proof <coughs> will, in a commercial transaction will be on the, the commercial person who wants to demonstrate that there is no contract because the presumption is there is a contract, 
So if you want to show that the contract, uh, that there was no intention, then it's up to you to prove that. In a family situation, it's the other way around. Because the presumption is that there is no contract, that there is no intention, then the onus is on the person who wants to demonstrate that there was intention. So that's more than half of the subject, right? Okay, this topic. That's getting your head around that concept. The other part of this is what is the effect of preliminary agreements uh, or conditional clauses? So it's things like subject to finance uh, or those cascading clauses. If this happens, then that will happen. But I only pay you that amount if this other thing happens. Is it actually intended to be binding? Uh, so we'll talk about that. The key case in that area is Masters and Cameron. And Masters and Cameron sets out three categories of preliminary agreement. And it would be worth your while understanding what they are. Um, so I put a little extra box on this slide because it, otherwise it just looks too damn easy. Uh, and it's not that easy. Um, we have some situations where difficulties arise. For example, honour clauses, letters of comfort, um, the government, is the government your family or is the government commercial? Most of us would think probably neither of those things. Many of us would hope neither of those things. Uh, and so we need to think about when we're entering into contracts with government as well. Um, and I have mentioned preliminary agreements as being one of the more difficult categories. So your textbook I think is particularly eloquent on this topic. Um, reading the chapter will help you understand where you're up to. Uh, the quote here is a bit long, but whether the parties appear to intend to create a binding agreement is relevant to the question whether a bargain has been struck and each party has, quote, paid for, end quote, the promises made by the other. It has been argued that the doctrine of consideration provides the essential test of enforceability in common law and it's unnecessary to make a separate inquiry whether the parties appeared to, be bound, uh, to intend to be bound. It is clear, however, that not all agreements involving valuable exchanges will be enforced. Although satisfaction of the requirement goes without saying in most cases, there is no doubt that a contract will not be made if the parties to the agreement appear not to have intended to create legal obligations. So this goes to that very argument of whether or not intention and consideration are the same thing. And the authors of your text and many, many other scholars argue no, that they are not, that they need to be thought about as separate and distinct events. But you can see that they are clearly related. Craig, your question. So is a prenup a commercial or a family-related contract? Well, what are they called now? Binding family arrangements or something or other? I guess I can't really out anybody and say, are you subject to a prenup? Can you remind me what they're called under the Family Law Act? There is actually Family Law Act. But when you think about them as a principle, um, and this is wound up, it could get complicated because there was a common law principle that affected contracts about contemplation of marriage and whether a contract made in contemplation of marriage could be enforceable or not. But um, if we put that to one side, if you think about the idea of a prenup, the idea of a prenup is for two people to agree that if their relationship ends up not working out, what each of them is going to get. And by its very nature, one would think the intention is that it would be binding. Um, but because it's a family type relationship, they were very rarely enforced in the olden days. Um, and there were, in fact, some, I believe in some places, some statutory impediments to being able to enforce them even if you documented them properly. Not my area. I've always managed to marry people who've got much less money than me <laughs> and then make a whole heap after we get divorced. So, you know, what can you say? But, um, yeah, so take contract law advice for me, not uh, organising yourself. Um, no, I, sorry. So, yes, objective test. So we use an objective test. That won't surprise anybody, right? Um, 
because we're looking to see whether or not the parties manifest an intention. So it's clumsy language. I don't know when you last used manifest and you weren't talking about people who went down in an aircraft crash. Um, did the parties manifest an intention to create legal relations? So we are looking not at what they might have thought, but what they actually did. So merit and merit is a good example here. Intention is determined by whether a reasonable person regards the agreement as intended to be binding, not by what they actually intended. So in that one, Mr Merritt kept making promises, often on the court steps, so that the matter could be, uh, wouldn't be heard, um, and then saying, no, that wasn't his intention, after all, to make that or to keep that promise. Um, and so the judgment there, I think it's in Merit and Merit, um, the judgment talks about practical jokes. And that actually you've got to, if you're, it doesn't matter what you actually intended. If we've got two people who are practical jokers, each of them promising the other something, but the other doesn't know that they're joking and that nothing by their conduct would know that they were joking, you can end up with two parties who subjectively didn't want to, it didn't intend to be bound, but who will be because their conduct manifests an intention to create legal relations. Um, court will also take into account surrounding circumstances. Actually, the practical joking quote is in Air Great Lakes. Now, Air Great Lakes, I believe there is a copy of the full case on Canvas. It should be there. Um, it's fairly handy because, for a change, it's not ancient. And it has quite a good summary of what the law is. I put links in Canvas, too, to a couple of more recent ones. Um, largely because, and I've, I've highlighted out where the paragraphs are that really summarise what the law is. Um, and if you don't feel like reading something from how long ago is it now? 50 odd years ago? Well, not quite. <laughs> 30 odd years ago, you can read this one. No, I can't. That's 40 odd years. Goodness me. Uh, Merit and Merit, Lord Denning. The court does not try to discover the intention by looking into the minds of the parties. It looks at the situation in which they were placed and asks itself, would reasonable people regard the agreement as intended to be binding? Okay, pretty straightforward. You're used to using an in, uh, this kind of test now. Uh, Shahid. Shahid provides authority for what an Australian court will look at in determining whether or not the parties actually intended a relationship. In particular, it looks at whether or not payment has been made and accepted, whether the relationship had an element of arm's length about the subject matter at hand, so negotiation would be an example of that, or the documentation of terms and conditions, uh, and actually documentation itself. So Shahid, is a really interesting case, I think. Dr Shahid wanted to be a dermatologist and in order to actually practice as a dermatologist, she had to meet a... Uh, she had to become a member of the College of Dermatologists. So a College of Dermatologists is... It's effectively a club, right? That not dissimilar to the Law Institute of Victoria or the, Sup the Supreme Court of Victoria, which many of you hope one day to be admitted to. You, can't, you won't be able to practice your trade as lawyers unless you have a practising certificate, if you can demonstrate you're a member of that club. Um, so, and similarly, if you go to the bar, then you have to do reading, you have to pass the bar and get into that club instead. Uh, so she applied, I think, over three or four years, and every year they said no. Um, I don't know. I always think she probably had a combination of a surname and an extra X chromosome that weren't helping her just somehow. I, I think I can't work out whether they were misogynistic or racist or a little bit of both, but we'll see. Uh, so every year she then appealed their decision and every year they showed her their complex appeal process, took some money from her and then didn't do anything. So after it happened about four times, she sued them and said, 
actually, this is a contract. You have to review my appeal and make a decision on the merits. You can't just not do that. And they said, don't be silly, we are the college. We are a royal college of dermatologists. We never get up for a skincare emergency in the middle of the night. Um, we can do what we like and we live in Perth, so we go sailing a lot. Um, and we don't have time to do that. And frankly, this is a professional association. The way that we organise ourselves is our business and nothing to do with you. And the court said, surprisingly, actually, because the way they organise their profession is their business and nothing to do with us, um, surprisingly, in a way, they said, no, that's not right. Actually, she paid you money. You set out a very complex documented process under which you said you were going to review her appeal. They are the terms of the contract. It was not a small amount of money either. It was a significant amount of money that would represent a reasonable fee for the amount of work that you should have done to review the process. So it's a good case, it's a useful case for understanding that it's also a good understanding that idea of intention and it also demonstrates circumstances where nominal consideration wouldn't have been enough. In order to get the intention, nominal consideration will be enough in a commercial contract most often, but there will be times when it's nebulous where there needs to be some demonstrable price. So, presumptions. Where are we, at? Yep. we have already spoken about presumptions. If you're listening on a recording or watching this video, we've talked about what a presumption is and what a rebuttable presumption is when we were doing the quiz, which will be the recording before. Um, so, it's a traditional approach, a traditional shortcut. When I was at uni before Irma Genus, this is what we had to learn. Um, really these days it has only limited value um, but it's understanding what a presumption is, is the value to you and understanding that this is where we start from but it is not a difficult thing to overturn a presumption. So the key case here is Irma Genus and the Greek Orthodox community of South Australia. So the bishop, Irma Genus, was off being a bishop somewhere in Greece. He got headhunted. I had no idea until I read this case that bishops could be headhunted, but he was. So he's headhunted to come to South Australia and be the spiritual leader of the Orthodox, the Autocellif, uh, there I put the word there because I can't pronounce it, the Greek Orthodox churches in Australia, but he was going to live in South Australia. And he did that job for 23 years. 23 years of full immersion baptisms, 23 years of ouzo out the back of people's garages. Uh, it's a 24-7 job. You're there counselling people before they get married, uh, dealing with people at funerals, spiritual guidance the whole way. Um, he didn't get holidays. He didn't do anything. And then other than guide his spiritual flock, and after 23, oh, actually, what else happened? They, he did get a payment. Uh, he did get payment. Um, group tax was taken out of his, um, it was called at that time, his PAYG. Uh, he reported to a board, effectively, like he was the CEO of spirituality and they were the overseeing body. So if he wanted to build a new church or... I don't know, get new robes or whatever it is that he needed to do. He, um, he needed to get the authority there. Sorry, I'm possibly offending people as I'm being... I grew up very Catholic and I'm very, very cynical about... So this is my baggage, not yours, about what churches spend their money on. So, um, but anyway, he did all of these things, right? He just did all of these things. And then after 23 years, he resigned. And he was sitting there thinking, 23 years, that's two and a bit lots of long service leave plus all those unpaid holidays. I can go and buy myself a Greek island. Well, it turned out they said, no, 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 you seem to have got this wrong. Dude, you are not, we don't have any contractual obligations to you. You are our spiritual leader. This is a social relationship. 
Uh, no contract of employment. No contract of employment at all. This is a spiritual guidance thing. You, you're doing this for love, dude. You know, in the, it's all coming out of the collection plate. Yeah, anyway, it ended up in the High Court. That's how adamant he was. And uh, ultimately, the High Court came down on his side. They said that they were concerned about the presumption that in a social or a fam family relationship that there is no contract, they were concerned about that ossifying into a rule of law. So becoming brittle, becoming a hard thing. Um, each case depends on its facts. They said, at best, the presumptions identify who bears the onus of proof. So the onus was on our bishop to demonstrate that a reasonable person would assume that there was an intention to enter into a contract. And the evidence he brought to support that was they gave me a contract, they asked me to leave Greece and come and do this. We had a, set, a standard a salary arrangement. They paid for where I lived. I reported to them. I had to give written reports. If they didn't agree with what I wanted to do, I had to do what they said. Um, I, it's part of, it was a commercial relationship. There we go. From that case, not only is there obvious difficulty in formulating rules intended to prescribe the kinds of cases in which an intention to create contractual relationships should or should not be found to exist, it would be wrong to do so. It would also be wrong for me to not let you have a drink and stretch your legs when it gets to half past. Can we take a five minute break and we'll come back and talk about commercial transactions. You at home, do the same.